You're going to be in for a treat. Good morning, Cross Life. How is everybody today? And you know, I guess tomorrow, I guess is officially Memorial Day. And out of all the patriotic holidays that we have, uh, I don't know, Memorial Day to me seems uh, the most special in so many ways because uh, we celebrate not just uh, the people that served. We're not really, we, it's not Veterans Day in that sense. It is Memorial Day. It is the veterans that have given literally their all. Those that have put themselves on the front lines and paid the ultimate price for the freedom that you and I, well, live in every single day in this country. With all its problems and all its situations, we still uh, are probably the freest country in the world. And it is because, indeed, amen, because men and women have been willing to sacrifice it all. And so Memorial Day is a day, yeah, we get together, maybe have a picnic, have a good time with friends. Please don't forget, don't forget what this day truly is meant to celebrate and what it is, and that is that we live in great, great freedom. And someone we don't even know paid a price, the ultimate price. But we also pray today for those who have loved ones that they did know and that they uh, lost in the midst of securing and keeping our freedoms. And so we pray for them today. So let me open up our service uh, with a word of prayer about this. Father God, thank you so, so much that we live in a place where we can We can worship, we can freely worship, and we have many, many freedoms that have been bestowed bestowed upon us, and that there were hundreds of thousands of people that have gone before us, and that paid the price for this freedom that we live in today. So, Lord, we are so grateful, so, so grateful, and we pray for those who have family members that remember the loss of a loved one who sacrificed for this great country. We honor them today, we lift them today, and we ask your continued comfort and blessing upon them. Fathers, we gather here today to worship in this wonderful freedom and to go into your word. We ask your blessing. We ask and pray that the Spirit of God would move and touch our lives in a powerful, powerful way today. We pray this, and everybody says, amen. Amen. Well, Have you ever felt unneeded at any time? Ever felt like you didn't really fit in life? Maybe even among your own peers. Uh, Have you ever said the the thought or had the thought, am I really needed here? I I know I have. I've said it multiple times uh, in in certain job situations. I'm just like, am I really needed here? Come on. And and so we we all run into this situation. My question to you today is, has it even happened to you in the church? Am I really needed here? Come on. 
In a world where it's sometimes hard to fit in, let me tell you something. God has a place for you in his church. Amen? He does. And, and I know some people hear that and, and they struggle because of maybe some history they've had with church. And they, they don't quite get it. And, my, and if you're struggling in any way with that, my heart is, please, just listen uh, with a little bit of an open heart today, if you would. The title today is, Does the Church Really Need Me? The answer is clear from Scripture. If you are a born-again believer in Jesus Christ, the church not only needs you, the church has gifted you with something to bless your fellow church with. That's the truth. Do you believe this? Raise your hands. Pretty much hands all over the place. That's good. Why do you believe it? And we're going back to that why question I was messing with you last week on. Why do you believe it? Do you believe it because I just said it? Or is there some other reason why you believe that to be true? Well, I can tell you, there is a reason for you to believe that. It comes right from Scripture. If you have your Bibles, open up to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 28. Yes, 1 through 28. We'll try to get you out of here in at least three hours. Sorry, Melissa. I no, I'm, I'm messing with you. Uh, we are going to go through a lot of verses today, uh, but we'll make it through on time for sure. As you find your way there on your phone or in your Bible, let me encourage you, uh, let me give you some background to this. I don't know if you knew, but uh, there was actually, we believe, four letters that was written uh, by Paul to the Corinthian church. We only have two of them in the Bible. Uh, there's references to them. Um, so what kind of city was this Corinth? Well, it was apparently geography wise, about 45 miles west of the great city of Athens, Greece. If you were to describe Corinth in that day, you might want to take the city of New York, the city of Los Angeles, the city of New Orleans, and the city of Las Vegas, and kind of meld them all together into one cesspool of sin. That's apparently what the city was like. It was, it was steeped with paganism. It was steeped with immorality. It was... It was had all kinds of different class systems that ruled this city, and the church in that particular city uh, could have been maybe labeled the poster child of the unhealthy church, to be quite honest with you, as you read Paul's letters and find out uh, what was going on there. Uh, people were getting saved. People's lives were getting transformed, uh, but they were tending to bring the culture into the church. Even so much that Paul even talks about incest, which wasn't even named among uh, the, the pagans. They wouldn't even be for that. But if you go into chapter 5, it talks about how they remove, uh, Paul tells them how you get unrepentant sinners out of the church, essentially. He goes into a rebuke in, in chapter 11, and, and I want you to, I'm going to read this uh, for you. It's a rebuke uh, that has to do with the Lord's Supper and how they were celebrating the Lord's Supper. Uh, it's not on the screen. Just listen to this. He says, uh, when you come together, is it not for the Lord's Supper that you eat? For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry and another gets drunk. What? Do you, do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God, humiliating who uh, have nothing? At, nothing? What shall I say? Shall I commend you for this? <laughs> no, I will not, he says. And, and so he, he's basically saying, look, you guys are coming together to celebrate this Lord's Supper as a church. Some of you are just taking food and grabbing all kinds of food and coming drunk. Just do that in your own house if you got to do it. And, and, and so he, he gives out a pretty strong rebuke. There were some issues going on in this church, to, <laughs> to say the least. But in chapter 12, where we're going to hang our hats today, he brings up a much more uh, positive uh, theme in here, and he's going to talk about spiritual gifts. And so let's pick up in verse 1. We'll look at 1 through 3 initially, and then we'll go through the, the passage together here. Let's look at chapter, uh, verse 1. It should be on the screen. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however they let, were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed 
And no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. He tells them right up front, you're ignorant about this spiritual gift thing, so let me inform you, essentially, is what he says. He's going to tell them about what he calls in Romans chapter 12, uh, in that verse, he calls them grace gifts. The point being that God gives you a gift. You don't earn this thing. He just gives it to you by his wonderful grace. And so he begins to talk about these things. Now, verse 3, what I read, it was a little bit confusing uh, for some of you. I think it talks about, well, whoever says that Jesus is accursed or Jesus is Lord. What, what was he talking about there? Um, essentially, uh, many of the commentators believe it was a reference to some of the, the pagan... Um, chants and things that were going in. Again, the church back then was speaking in tongues, uh, and, and there was this mix-up of things being said and some confusion. I, we think he's probably addressing something like that. His point being that if, you, if Jesus is truly your Lord, you only can say that through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so he again goes on and starts talking more specifically about gifts and things. So pick up now in verse 4. Now, there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are a variety of service, but the same Lord. And there's a variety of activities, but the same God who empowers them all in everyone. He lists out essentially three categories of things that are happening in the church. He says there's uh, gifts, okay? And he's going to talk a little bit about those gifts specifically in a moment. He says there's services. I don't know exactly what he's talking about, but he may be talking about things like the Lord's Supper or baptism or worship or evangelism and those type of things. So there's services that are, are taking place in the church uh, by the same Lord. And then there's these activities, which might be, hey, it might be a potluck, might be a church picnic, might be, you know, helping the poor in some way. So there's activities. So he kind of lays out three different kind of categories of things that are going on in the church. The point is that God is behind every one of those things. The activities, the services, the gifts. The other thing I want you to see here, which is very interesting, is the way he does this. I, I believe he's talking and trying to lay out the fact that there is a trinitary a God that we worship because he basically says there in that passage that, okay, the gifts are the same spirit. Talking about the Holy Spirit, he says the services are the same Lord. When, we, when you use the word Lord in the New Testament, he's really talking about the Lord Jesus. And then he goes on and says there's activities, but the same God. When he refers to God, Elohim, he's talking about God the Father. And so what I think is he's trying to do is to bring emphasis to the fact that you know what? Our triune God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have sanctified this activity of this unity of bringing believers into the church and letting them do this specifically in the context where he'll, he'll hang his hat is on these gifts or these spiritual gifts that he's talking about. And so in verse 7, he says, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. It is through the power of the third person of the Trinity that we have this giftedness. It is the Holy Spirit that brings this gift. It comes through the power of God the Father, through Jesus Christ as well, but in the manifestation of this gift, it's through Jesus. And then he tells us exactly why he gives these gifts. He says it's for the common good. Who, who here likes a little goodness in their life? Raise your hand. You like, everybody likes a little goodness, right? Who doesn't like a little goodness? And so that's what this does when we use these spiritual gifts together. And so he then starts to list out some of the gifts specifically, starting in verse 8. He says, For one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, another the utterance of knowledge, uh, according to the same Spirit, another faith by the same spirit, another gift of healing by the one spirit, another the working of miracles, another prophecy to the other, the ability to distinguish between spirits, uh, to another various kinds of tongues, and then the interpretation of tongues. And so you see there's a wide list of gifts that he talks about here. He talks about, excuse me, wisdom and knowledge. Now this might be divine wisdom, divine knowledge, a very specific 
uh, knowledge that somebody gets for God, a miraculous type of knowledge that he shares and gives. Uh, it may be more general. We don't really know for sure how that works out. He talks about the gift of faith, the spiritual gift of faith. This here cannot be the faith that we get when through salvation. That's already taken place. He's talking to believers. He's talking about faith where we say, you know what? I'm going to trust God. As a believer, I am going to trust God in this situation. So it's, it's that type of faith that he's talking about. Then he talks about healings, and, and this could be different kinds of healings that took place. He's going to talk about miracles, uh, which would be uh, something maybe beyond uh, just a healing, some other kind of miraculous thing that takes place. And he talks about prophecy. Now, we always hear that word prophecy. We always think, oh, well, the prophets. He's talking about somebody that is, is predicting the future. It doesn't necessarily mean predicting the future. It actually means it could be uh, a message that God has given somebody to share with somebody. It might be futuristic, maybe of the current situation. Okay? It, it may be uh, uh, more uh, or less uh, not spiritual in the sense that it's just uh, a word of God. Some people think in terms of my preaching or some uh, preacher's preaching, it is prophetic in nature, and so it might mean in that sense. Uh, there is discernment or distinguishing between uh, the spirits. Essentially, you can, you can kind of tell, and I know some people like this, uh, that they can tell when there's evil going on or where there's not evil going on or it's from God. And so people, I, I see that today, to be quite honest with you. And so then there's the tongues and interpretation of tongues. So they're in the church. The church was, a tongue was essentially an unknown language which somebody would speak. Uh, by, Paul goes into great detail and talks about the fact that you have to have an interpreter as well if this is actually going to take place. Uh, he talks about it in another place, uh, but there was a lot of abuse going on, and there's actually abuse, I think, going on with that gift even today in some contexts. Uh, so this, I want to tell you, is not an extensive gift or gift list. There's other giftings uh, also mentioned in, in Romans chapter 12. There's also another place, I can't remember where that was off the top of my head, but all these gifts are from God worked through the Holy Spirit. The question uh, for us is, do these same gifts still happen today in the church? Do, do healings really happen? Do, do miracles really happen? Do, do, what's the deal with tongues? Now, I don't want to get to a, a, a long list of, of debates over some of these things, but I will give you a couple views. views that some people view that these things do take place. They, they are happening. Uh, some people believe that they have ceased. They're, the view is called sensationists. They believe that these gifts have ceased. Uh, they were God gave it to the church at the beginning through the apostles, okay? And then after the apostles were gone, they, they, he didn't really manifest those gifts. Some believe that it manifests until the Bible came around. So we have the Word of God. And once that came out and people started to have an availability to reading those things, uh, then the gifts kind of started to cease. To be quite honest with you, um, I see some of these things. Uh, in reality, uh, in real life, uh, healings where somebody hits me on the head and says, boing, you're fixed. Uh, I haven't seen that to be real, to be quite honest with you. But I know God, and I'm not putting that man, that God, <laughs> in a box. <laughs> he can do whatever he wants, and he will do whatever he wants. So uh, that's kind of my piece on, on that piece. But you understand that there are spiritual gifts that are being used throughout the body, uh, meaning the body of Christ. What I do want you to see, and what's really important, uh, is in verse 11. Verse 11 says this. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who appropriates or gives to each one individually as he wills. He's, he's making the point again here that this is through the Spirit's functioning, right? And who he gives individually as he wills, this is where we believe that God gives every single person who is a believer in Jesus Christ a spiritual gift, at least one. He gives, he says, as he wills. Each one individually he gives a gift to. He gives this spiritual gift. This gift is to be used for, we knew or we learned already, for the common good. And what that means is you are needed in the church because God has equipped you with a spiritual gift to be used for the common good in the church. You are needed. 
And because God has gifted you in such a way that you can bless, your gifting may be something you maybe not even quite discovered yet. Sometimes people are gifted musicians or gifted accountants or gifted orators or teachers, and, and, and those are, are talents that people have. They aren't necessarily spiritual gifts. They can be, but they aren't necessarily. What happens is when we do use our talents and maybe a spiritual, uh, and spiritual giftedness together for the edification of the body, Therein lies a spiritual gift that you might have and that you can essentially unleash to bless the church, to bless for the common good. That gift may be hospitality. Maybe you're just a really hospitable person. You have a great smile. And you know what? You say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to serve right out there in the front at the, the front door team. Maybe your gift is prayer. You are a prayer warrior. You stay behind the scenes and you pray. And that's what you do. That might be one of your giftedness. Maybe you just have the gift of smile. <laughs> you, you can just smile and people just are, are, are drawn to you. Again, we'll, put you, we'll let you greet people out front or, or be a hostess for something. Maybe you have that gift of, of discernment and, and you, can, you can really understand people's problems and you can speak to them and you can give uh, godly wisdom. Maybe that is your gift. The Spirit equips us for the common good. Well, Paul then goes into an extensive uh, detail, building his analogy, essentially, to make his point. He, he, he tells us, and, and I, I'm going to, before we get into the analogy, I'm just going to tell you exactly what his point is, and then we'll look at the analogy. But uh, this is it. This is, I believe, his point right up front. He basically says, you, okay, you readers in Corinth, and you, the church here, you, uh, no matter your differences, no matter your backgrounds, those who name the name of Jesus Christ, those who are born again, who have been washed by the blood of God, who are a repentance that are lovingly following Christ, you have released your heart to God. And you, my friend, matter to the church. You are important, and you have a place. I think that's exactly what he's trying to communicate. And so in verse 12, he again sets the stage for his analogy. He says this, he says, uh, but just as the body is one and many members, okay, members here is this, your fingers, your arms, your legs. This is, he's talking about the human body there. And then all of the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. And so again, he's, he's building this analogy. He's, he's taking the human body. And what an amazing thing this thing is. It, not just mine, yours too. I, I mean, I mean <laughs> I, yeah, I, I, I'm not talking just me. I, all of us in the human condition, man, I mean, it's just amazing. I can say I want to move my finger, and I can move my finger. And there's all kinds of neurons and protons and, I don't know protons, but uh, things going on, chemical things going on in your brain, and, and it just works. It's just, I mean, I don't know. I get, when I think about it, and I, I love biology. I can tell I'm not really good at it, but I love it. <laughs> I, I, it's just, I mean, the human body is just so amazing. It truly is. And this is Paul's point. We have so many parts to our moving body, our brains and our noses, our lungs and our digestive system, all this stuff. And it all works together. And then he says, so it is with Christ. So it is with Christ. And what you need to understand here is he, he, he's talking about the church. He's talking, he says, he's using Christ as the church. Now, this isn't something new in Scripture. Remember, Jesus said he is the, the bride of Christ, or the, and, and uh, the church is the bride of Christ. And so the church and Christ oftentimes are, are pictured as one. And this is definitely what he's saying here. So it is with Christ, referring to the church. 
And so in verse 13, he says this, and 14, he says, for one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Okay, the baptized believers into one body, the church. Jews and Greeks, slaves and free people, all kinds of people. And they were all made to drink of the same spirit. We all have the same Holy Spirit, okay? For the body does not consist of one member, but many members. The church body has many members, many people doing God's work. It is, the church is made up of so many different people, different backgrounds and different experiences, different social status, but we are all one church. This works for the church locally for sure. The, 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 the individual Cross Life Community Church or the Baptist Church or the Presbyterian Church or whatever down the road, it works in that context. It works, I think, in the universal context, meaning the church universal as well. Here, I believe the context he's talking about certainly is the local church. Uh, but here's the, here's the takeaway. I want you, if you're filling out notes and taking notes here, here's the takeaway. I want this section of the passage. Uh, there is diversity with great unity. There, there is diversity with great unity. We are empowered and gifted by the same Holy Spirit. This idea of diversity and unity, we hear about it all the time today, right? Diversity and unity, that's what everybody wants. Well, you know what? It happens in the church when we get it right. There's all kinds of diverse people that come together and that are bound by the mission of Christ to go tell people of the good news of Christ. And then we're also bound by this Holy Spirit that indwells and gifts each one of us. It's an amazing thing how we are united in this way. And, and Paul then... He, he just, he's just going off, man. He's, he just overstates this example like crazy, but I love it. I love it. This is what he said in verse 13. If, if the foot says, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. And if the ear would say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. You ever feel like you don't belong, you don't fit in? Well, oh, man, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not so talented as so-and-so. You know, I just, that's not true. You may not be talented as so-and-so in such a way, but you know what? You are part of the body, and you are who you are and who God made you to be. The church is never supposed to be a comparison game between its members, okay? We are all made differently. And we are all gifted uniquely. Did you hear me? We, we are all made differently and gifted uniquely, every single one of us. So Paul continues again with this illustration. Verse 17, if the whole body were an eye, uh, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? Uh, but if it is, or as it is, God arranged the members of the body, each one of them, as he chose. And if all were uh, a single member, where would the body be? As it were, we are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need for you, nor again the head uh, to the feet, I have no need for you. No. You see, we are all the same. If we're all the same, it wouldn't work, right? If we were all a bunch of singers, where would the praisers be there? If we were all a bunch of praisers, who'd be up here? Every one of us has a special part in the church. Everyone's needed. Everyone is gifted. Everyone is part of God's redemptive plan. We are not as effective, though, if we're missing a part, right? If there's a part missing. I, I remember trying to, to ride my tricycle with only three, two wheels of the three. Doesn't work very well. I also remember ride, riding my bike. Ever tried to pedal up a hill with one pedal on your bike? Hard, isn't it? You know what I'm talking about. You guys, yeah, you know, you know, too. 
That, that's just, it just doesn't work very well. That's the point Paul's making. If we stay home, if we forsake the assembly, and we don't use our gifts, the body suffers. The body suffers. The church will not be as effective. I believe this to be true in every church, in any church. The next few verses, Paul, these are kind of interesting <laughs> verses, uh, but let's take a look at it. Verse 20, starting in verse 22, it says, On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker or indispensable, and on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow greater honor, and our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which are more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the parts that lack it. I don't know about you, even when I read it again, it's kind of a little confusing. What is he talking about exactly? <laughs> what I believe he's talking about is that the church in Corinth in that situation had, had really brought a lot of the social aspect of the culture into their church. There was a, this social caste system, and people were being valued uh, less than they should have been, or people were looking at and placing judgment on other people because they were doing this or that. And so people were essentially basing their spirituality, their effectiveness, their worth based on their performance and what they were doing. Uh, the Corinthian culture, much, much like ours, is upset, was obsessed with power and with status. And so it was causing them to essentially uh, overvalue some members and undervalue other members. And so I believe it is in that section of the scripture where he's, he's talking about uh, that he's trying to level the playing ground. I also believe he was trying to tell them, you know what, even if you have the smallest our most insignificant in your mind job in the church, it means no less honor. It is no less important. So if you're the person who just cleans up, you're not just cleaning up. <laughs> Man, you're the one that, that prepares this place this, so it looks wonderful, inviting for everybody that comes in. Uh, I, I'm just a, a prayer warrior. Are you kidding me? Pray first, right? Who's still doing this? I hope everybody. Man, prayer behind it. We, don't, we can't do anything without prayer behind it. And so if all you do, really, a lot of what you do is praying behind the scenes, man, that's so important. What if you're, I'm just, I'm just a greeter. I'm just saying out front. I don't really do. No, 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 no. You, when, you, when you welcome somebody into this church and you make them feel like, man, this is a nice place, this is a special place, you are literally, literally, being the hands and feet of Jesus, making them feeling welcome. Man, it is so, so important. Man, I, I, all I do, I just count money. You know what? We need people to count. We need people of honesty and integrity to be able to count the offering. You see, every position, it isn't about being up here. It's being gifted by God and using this giftedness. In verses 25 through 27, he tells us the why again, okay? And I love the way he does this. He says, and there may be, so that there be no division in the body, uh, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, they all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. <laughs> when we use our gifts, okay, it builds a deep unity within the body. So you know what? I've had a hard day. I've had a bad situation hit my family. You know what? It affects me, but it also affects you. And when you have a bad situation hit your family, you know what? It affects me personally. 
I'm going to do what I can to help, and I'm going to pray for you, and I'm going to, I'm going to step it out and, and try to serve and get the body to serve. You, you begin to see the deep unity that begins to build when the people use the gifts that God has given them. It's a beautiful, beautiful picture. Using your giftedness unites the church. It builds the fellowship. Literally, it takes on Christ-likeness when you use your giftedness. Amen? All right, I think you're getting it today. All right. Verse 28, he kind of just kind of closes this, this section up and basically says, uh, God has appointed to the church, okay? First apostles, second prophets, then third teachers, then miracles and gifts of healing and administration and various kinds of tongues. And so he kind of closes out this thought, and then he goes into chapter 13, which you all know, 1 Corinthians 13, that's the love chapter, right? All about love. The spiritual gift and love, by the way, are very connected, very connected. So again, this church in Corinth, again, the, the poster child of the not-so-perfect church, um, don't, don't throw too many stones at them. We've got to make sure we look at ourselves all the time, right, too? What was true was that the love of Christ was not being reflected in their community. They looked a whole lot like the rest of the community, like the culture. They imported a lot of the culture into their church. The hierarchism, the, the classism, the even the sexual deviancy stuff going on. That's not to be, Paul says. I, one of the commentators I read is a guy named Stephen Um. I like I really liked what he wrote about this. It's on the screen. He said Paul goes to get them to take a hard look at themselves and help them make a mid-course adjustment so that their community becomes a witness to the beauty of the gospel. The main point that Paul was trying to get, act, uh, to get across is this. God has designed his church to be a community of complementary and interdependence. The church is to be complementary, that it is each member brings something to the table that the others need and is enhanced by their interdependence. It, it, you begin to see the picture of how God has designed us and the, the connectedness that takes place when we use our giftedness. So when we ask the question, does the church need me? The answer, friends, is yes, yes it does. It does. It has a place for everybody. What, what breaks my heart often, though, is when I hear people say, I love Jesus, but mm, I don't know so much about the church. Uh, to be quite honest, that actually kind of breaks my heart. And maybe you've said that. Maybe you felt that. Maybe you were hurt in the church. Maybe you've left for a while. Maybe you're listening, and maybe it's the first time you got online in a long time, and somehow you got to this crazy sermon. And, and uh, I get it. I get it. It happens. Uh, the church is made up of faulty people, <laughs> every one of us. Pastor included. It is still, though, the bride of Christ, and it is still uh, what God uses for transformation into his kingdom. Uh, we are designed to live our life together, and, and I do. I believe this with all my heart. I, I have lived this idea, this thought about the church for over 30 years. I also love this. Stephen Hume also said this. He said, the end goal of one's identities and abilities is not to build up of self, but to build up of others. Our identity, <laughs> our abilities are to build up others. He goes on, the intended dynamic of gift giving is meant to be at play here. This is why God gives gifts. And so we can build, again, build up the body. Tim Keller also says this about this passage. He says, no one is merely a consumer of services, but everyone is a distributor. Everyone is a distributor. As one distributes through the use of their gifts, 
Truth is, they're actually getting back. <laughs> it, it is one of the great, what I call, oxymorons of Christianity. You've heard me say it before. As you give, you... As you give, you get. We, we believe this. We know this to be true as we give financially to the church. It's not just true about giving financially. It's true about your, your giftedness, using your giftedness in church. When you do that, you end up actually getting. And what you get isn't just for yourself. It is also for the greater body. Truly, truly amazing. I love the way God works. Well, let me, if I can, kind of pull this together with one illustration. It actually comes from the movie Frozen. Who here has seen the movie Frozen? Most people in the church have seen the movie Frozen. If you haven't seen the movie Frozen, it's about this uh, uh, sister's, uh, what's her name again? Uh, <laughs> Elsa and, and Aunt Anna. Elsa and Anna. Elsa and Anna, they're sisters. Elsa's the older one. She has these magical powers, and, and she ends up hurting her sister, and then she realizes she can't control it, and so she essentially uh, does this terrible thing, and then she runs off to hide in the mountains, and her sister wants to, to bring her back because she believes she can help and save everybody. And so in the midst of this thing, they create this really cool little snowman. Remember him? Olaf, yeah, he was so cute, right? Well, Olaf, Olaf has the line of the entire movie. I don't know if you remember this line, but th this is the line of the entire movie. It says, an act of true love will thaw a frozen heart. An act of true love will thaw a frozen heart. So movie plays out. Elsa is in dire danger. She's going to die. And Anna becomes the, the savior figure, willing to, to risk her life to save her sister. Essentially an act of true love. Right? Here's what I want you to remember. When we operate in our giftedness by the Holy Spirit, we are living out an act of true love that thaws a frozen heart. When we operate in our giftedness, we are acting out true love, and it thaws a broken heart. Let me tell you how that worked out for me, personally. Some 35 years ago, I went to my now wife, then girlfriend's church in Seaford, Delaware. Now, my history in church was a little different. I was, grew up Catholic, and this is not, I'm not bashing Catholic, this was just my experience in the Catholic church. It, it really was always about how fast you could get out, literally. And I, one of my fondest memories of church was running out of the church with my sisters going, wow, man, Father V got us out in 35 minutes, Woohoo! That was it, man, we, he broke the record. We're like, Father V's the man, yeah, we, we got out in 35. That, literally, that was it. That was kind of, again, I was young back then. I was, and again, I, I'm not saying bad anything about Catholic. It, it, it was just my experience. But when my wife took me, and then girlfriend again, to the First Baptist Church of Seaford, it was something like I'd never experienced before. It was totally different. There, there was warm greetings. There was people handing me a bulletin. There were people just, everybody was just smiling. They were shaking my hands, and, and they would talk to us, ask us questions as we're coming in. I, I, I remember this question all the time. Oh, the, the, the ladies would ask Michelle, oh, who's this handsome young man you brought in? <laughs> man, I was a hit with the 75 and older crowd. I'm just telling you, I was. <laughs> they loved me. They loved me, man. I think it's because their prescription glasses weren't any good anymore. But, no, it was... I did, it was just, there was just all this love stuff going on. It was just awesome. There would be somebody playing the piano. There would be somebody that would come up and, and give the prayer for the service or the offering. And, and man, the, the preacher would always preach from the scriptures. He was, he was giving us the word of God. He would share the gospel every time. And it was just something like I had never heard before. And in the midst of those different times I would go, the word of God 
began to sink into my heart. I remember some of the, the we'd have luncheons sometimes after church, and man, everybody, it seemed like everybody had the gift of uh, cooking. <laughs> there was some really good home-cooked food. But I also remember just everybody was just polite and helping each other and getting food for others, and, and it was just this wonderful, wonderful experience. And every time I left that church, I could tell you people were using their spiritual gift. And let me tell you this, the hardness in my heart, every time I walked out of that place, was thawed just a little bit more until I finally gave my life to Christ. Amen? We all have gifts. We all have a role to play. It does not matter any kind of ethnicity, financial background, any sin background. If you are a repentant sinner, ready to walk with Jesus as best you can, man, you now have a gift through the power of the Holy Spirit that you are to use in the body of Christ in his church. And when we use this gift, it begins to communicate God's love to everybody around us. And ultimately, what it does is it glorifies God. Amen? Amen. But let me give you a couple next steps as we move forward here. Number one, make a goal to use your, your giftedness in the church regularly. Many of you in this church are using multiple gifts. <laughs> uh, some of you are working probably out of your giftedness, per se, and still serving and loving on, on this church, and uh, God honors that, I can tell you. But maybe that's not you. Maybe you're struggling in that way. Maybe you're online, and you're at home, and you're thinking, well, well, maybe, maybe. Make it a goal to use your giftedness. Number two, if you are not sure what your gift really is, okay, our church has a, a spiritual gift assessment where we'll take you through some questions and, and try to help you find out where you might want to plug in or how God has maybe wired you and equipped you that way. Go to our website, go to join a team, okay? Under that heading, there's a place where you can uh, click on and sign up to get a spiritual gifts test. Love to have some people do that. If you've never done that before, if you're struggling in that area, we want to offer that help to you. So, when we think about this idea of true love thawing a frozen heart, well, we also are reminded of somebody else that did a true act of love, right? <laughs> His name was Jesus, right? And, and unlike the soldiers that died for our freedom, okay, Jesus died also, but he didn't die for just this country. He died for every single human being ever created because he created them and he loves them. And so he invites them to accept the gift. The gift of faith, the gift of forgiveness. If you have never done that, if you've never asked God for forgiveness of your sin, I pray that you do this today. I pray that you do it right now. Because Jesus died. He went to the cross. He paid the punishment for our sin. He said, you know what? Believe upon my name and you will be saved. He offers that. I pray if anybody's in this room, if anybody's online, if you haven't done, ever done that, please do it today. Do it right now. Don't leave this place until you do. If you did, let us know. We want to help you in that journey. Let me pray, and then we got one more song, and we're going to worship out together. All right? Father God, thank you so much for your love and your mercy. I pray that you are working in the hearts of of the people that are listening, that are here and that are online. I pray that you are working in a special, special way. Father, help us to, to see how you have gifted us and help us to continue to, to use this giftedness to, to glorify you. And Lord, we're so thankful that we can hear and understand now through your scripture how powerful that truly is. And Father, we pray. We pray that you would work in the hearts and the lives of those who are seeking you today. I pray that they would say yes to you.
to your gift of salvation. They say yes to your love. We pray this in Jesus' name, and everybody says amen. We got one more song we're going to praise out, right? <laughs>